The most beautiful love story in the world is that between Muhammad and Aisha. There are many well-known love stories such as Romeo and Juliet and in Arabia Antara and Abla, Qais and Layla. But in my opinion, the story of Muhammad and Aisha is the most beautiful story of all. And the most beautiful thing about it is that it is narrated by Lady Aisha herself. Was Prophet Muhammad a pedophile or a child molester because he married Aisha in the age of nine? Before we directly address this question, I would like us to take a look at the nature of the relationship between the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Aisha as described in her very own words. She says that when she would complain of a headache, Muhammad would reply, it is my head then that aches. The love between them had reached such depth that he could feel what she felt, feel her pain and feel her joy. He was closer to her than her own father. Once there was a dispute between them, like ordinary marital disputes that occur in any household, he asked her, who would you like us to get as a mediator between us? How about asking your father? She agreed. So he got her father and then asked her, would you like me to tell him the problem or would you like to do so yourself? She said, you tell him the problem, but say only the truth. Of course, it was audacious of her to say that to the Prophet, peace be upon him, but it serves to illustrate how free and comfortable she was in his presence. So since this was an inappropriate thing to say to the Prophet, who was known as the most truthful and trustworthy of all, her father jumped up angrily at her, but Muhammad, her husband, quickly intervened so that he would not harm her. He said to him, no Abu Bakr, this is not what we want from you and this is not why we invited you here. Abu Bakr then left angrily and Muhammad looked at Aisha and said, see, I saved you from the man. She also narrates that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, would see her drinking from a cup, he would drink from the same cup and make a point of putting his lips exactly where hers had been. Nowadays, if a man finds his wife drinking from a certain cup and he wants to drink, he will ask her, are there any clean ones? Lady Haisha also tells us of how he would race with her. Early on in their marriage, she beat him in a foot race. But later on, after she had put on some weight, they raced again and this time he won, which upset her. He said to her, oh Haisha, now we are even. Why are you sad? You won one time and now I won the other. He used to use endearing nicknames for her. In the Arabic language, when we want to give an endearing nickname to a young boy, we use a more feminine version of his name. For example, if a boy is called Anas, we call him Anusa. On the other hand, when it is a girl, we use a more masculine version of the name. Fatima, for example, would become Fatum. So the Prophet would say to Lady Aisha, O oh, Aish, here is Gabriel sending you greetings. So instead of calling her Aisha, since in Arabic a feminine name would usually end with an A, like Aisha, he called her Aish, which makes it masculine by removing the A. He would also feed her himself by actually putting morsels of food into her mouth. He has a saying, a man is rewarded even for a piece of food he puts into his wife's mouth. Most people took this to mean that a man is rewarded for providing for his wife and supplying her with food, drink, and clothes. However, if you pay attention to the actual words, it says, into his wife's mouth, meaning literally to put food into her mouth. Nowadays, how often do married couples feed each other? Only on their wedding day, just to capture it in a photograph. But do they ever do it again throughout their marriage? What really matters is later on during marital life. It should be filled with cuddling and loving, tender gestures. One day, a group of the Prophet's companions came to visit him at Lady Aisha's home. One of his other wives got word of the visit so she quickly prepared something for him to offer them, since maybe at that time Aisha had not yet learned to cook quickly or prepare nice dishes. When Lady Aisha opened the door and saw the food that had been sent, 
She was upset that another wife would send a dish to be served in her home and she smashed the platter onto the floor in the presence of the guests. If this same incident were to happen nowadays, the most likely reaction would be for the man of the house to say angrily, you embarrassed me in front of my friends. However, the Prophet peace be upon him just smiled and said, she's just a bit jealous. He then picked up the food himself and told her that she should replace the other wife's broken dish with one of her own and keep the broken one for herself. When Lady Aisha was asked about the first thing that the Prophet would do upon entering his home, she said he would start by brushing his teeth. Why would someone start by brushing his teeth upon returning home? Scholars said that she probably meant that he used to start by kissing his wife and she used brushing his teeth as a metaphor. This leads us to ask ourselves about the first thing a man does nowadays when he returns home. Men should reflect upon this and measure themselves to the Prophet's standards. Does a man start by kissing his wife when he returns back home? Or does he rush into the kitchen to see what's for dinner? Or does he keep yelling because the food is not ready yet? Or what? Why don't men start emulating the Prophet peace be upon him and kiss their wives as soon as they return home? If we men did that and took the Prophet peace be upon him as our example, there would be much more harmony at home. Lady Aisha was also always very proud of the fact that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had died in her arms. This doesn't sound like a victim of rape or molestation like Islamophobes like to claim she was. A 53-year-old man marrying a nine-year-old girl. Surely that is wrong. Today, in London, for example, that would definitely be wrong. But actually, in London a few centuries ago, it would not have been considered legally or morally wrong. Perhaps even nowadays, somewhere in this world, it is not considered wrong either. In order to declare that something is wrong, we must determine how it is wrong. What does it violate? Does it violate the law or does it violate social norms? So let us see what the Prophet violated here. Did he violate the law or did he violate customs and norms? Did the Prophet, peace be upon him, have any enemies? Of course he did. At that time, the Jews of Arabia were his enemies, the idol worshippers were his enemies, and the hypocrites in the Muslim community who pretended to be believers but were really not were also his enemies. Did they attack him regarding this matter? They had called him many things, a liar, a lunatic, a sorcerer, and a poet, implying that he had written the Quran himself. But no one called him a pedophile. Why did they forget to? It would have been a marvelous chance to destroy him and to consequently destroy the religion that he came with. But the actual reason was that there had been no violation of any laws or social norms. The marriage contract between the Prophet and Aisha took place when she was six years old, but the marriage was not consummated until she was nine. So that means that there was a period of three years during which he had waited. What was he waiting for if he was a pedophile? The younger the better, right? Actually, he was waiting for her to reach puberty. In other words, he married her when she became physically mature. Some people may argue that reaching puberty does not necessarily mean that a girl is ready for sexual intimacy. The Encyclopedia Britannica states that in human physiology, puberty is the stage at which a child becomes an adult capable of reproduction and procreation. People may argue that even if a girl reaches physiological puberty, that does not mean that she is mentally mature enough to get married. So let us see whether Lady Aisha was mentally mature or not. There was a famous incident called the Incident of Slander, which took place two years after the actual marriage between Prophet Muhammad and Aisha, meaning that she must have been 11 years old. The hypocrites spread a false and spiteful rumor that she had committed adultery with one of the companions of the Prophet. This was the biggest event to shake the Islamic community at the time. Rumors of adultery were circulating about one of the mothers of the believers. 
which was the title given to the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Besides being the wife of the Prophet, Aisha also happened to be the daughter of Abu Bakr as siddiq the closest companion to the Prophet. It was altogether a very ugly situation. At the same time, Archangel Gabriel had not descended with words to Muhammad, peace be upon him, for a whole month. So it was a very difficult time. When Aisha heard about what was going on, she was very upset and felt unwell. She asked the Prophet if she could go and stay at her parents' home because she wanted to talk to her mother about what people were saying. Now let us observe the maturity with which she dealt with the situation. She recounts that the Prophet, peace be upon him, came to visit her at her parents' home. As he entered, he asked her how she was. She replied, I am fine, thank God. He said, Aisha, if you have committed a sin, then repent to God. And if you are innocent, then be sure that God will reveal your innocence. Note the kindness that poured from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Any man in his place would be angry and demand to know the truth. But he didn't do that. He just told her that if she had committed a sin, she should repent to God. And if she was innocent, then God would reveal her innocence. She recounts that she looked at her mother and told her to answer the Prophet on her behalf. She wanted her mother to defend her. As I said before, rumors had been circulating for about a month at this point. Her mother was speechless and said, I don't know what to say to the Prophet. Next, she turned to her father and asked him to defend her. But he also answered that he did not know what to say. So she looked at the three of them and said, By God, I know you have heard the rumor so many times that you have come to believe it and it has settled deep inside you. If I tell you that I am innocent, and to herself she said, And God knows I am, you will not believe me. And if I tell you that I have sinned, you will believe me. By God, I cannot find anything to say except what was said by the father of Joseph. She was so agitated that she had forgotten the name of Jacob. And she recited the Quranic verse. So for me, let it be patience without complaining. And it is God alone whose help I seek in the face of what you say. She recounts, I then went to bed and cried till I felt my tears would run dry. And I was confident that God would reveal my innocence, but I never thought that someone as insignificant as me would be mentioned in the Quran, in verses that will be recited till the end of time. She had no hope that actual verses of the Quran would descend upon the Prophet to reveal her innocence. The most she hoped for was that the Prophet would receive revelation through one of his prophetic dreams proving her innocence. But lo and behold, Verses of the Quran did in fact descend revealing her innocence. The Quran says, It was a group from among you that concocted the lie. Do not consider it bad for you, it was good for you. And every one of them will be charged with the sin he has earned. He who played the greatest part in it will have a painful punishment. When you heard the lie, why did believing men and women not think well of their own people and declare this is obviously a lie? And thus Lady Aisha's innocence was proven and the incident serves this discussion to illustrate just how very mature Aisha was. Perhaps even more mature than most middle-aged women would be nowadays. So we have established that she was physically, emotionally, and mentally mature. Nowadays, in Arab countries, like Egypt, for example, since I'm Egyptian, girls living in urban communities marry at an average age of 22 to 23 after finishing college. On the other hand, in rural communities, a girl usually gets married at the age of 18 after finishing secondary school, probably because most girls from rural communities do not go to college. So, before there were schools and colleges, what did girls do after reaching puberty? They got married. So it is consistent all over the world that the age of marriage differs depending on a woman's specific circumstances pertaining to work and education. Thirdly, 
the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not even violate the norms of non-Arabs. One of his wives was Lady Safiya bin Tuhuyay ibn Akhtar. She was the daughter of one of the most prominent Jewish men in the Arab Peninsula. The Prophet, peace be upon him, married her after the Battle of Khaybar when she was 14 years old. And he happened to be her third husband. I wonder how old she must have been when she married her first husband. There is no record of that, maybe nine or ten. So this neither violated the norms of Arabs nor those of non-Arabs. That was the norm for all people across the world at that time. 545 years after the marriage between Muhammad and Aisha, the Byzantine king Alexius II married Princess Agnes when she was nine years old. 15 years later, that is 560 years after the marriage of Muhammad and Aisha, another Byzantine king, Isaac II, also married a Hungarian princess, Princess Margaret, who was also nine years old. That was in the year 1184 AD. All of this means that the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not violate the norms or laws of any civilization, including the Arabs, Jews, or Europeans, even after six centuries of the evolution of human civilization. It is ironic that most of the criticism regarding the Prophet's marital life comes from societies in which divorce rates have reached 80% in the first three years of marriage. It just doesn't make sense. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was the perfect example of a husband. One of the most significant factors that prove that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was not a pedophile, is that out of the 12 women whom he married throughout his life, four of them were significantly older than him, namely Khadija, Umm Salama, Zainab bint Khuzayma, and Sauda bint Zana. Actually, one of them was of such an age that she no longer was interested in sexual relations anymore, as narrated in the biography of the Prophet, since she donated her night to the other wives. All the rest of his wives were in the normal age of marriage of women of the 20th and the 21st century, except for Aisha, whom we just explained about. Had he been a pedophile, God forbid, then why didn't he marry only young girls? Or even mostly young girls? Another significant point regarding his wives is that he married Khadija when he was a young man of 25 and she was an older woman, being 40 at that time. Muhammad, peace be upon him, loved her immensely and remained married only to her for 25 years until she died at the age of 65. He then remained an unmarried widower for three years before remarrying. The point I want to make here is, if he were a pedophile, God forbid, why would he have remained married only to Khadija for 25 years as she inevitably grew ever older and not even take a second wife who was much younger? What really surprises me is to hear some Christians criticizing the Prophet on this matter, even though According to the Encyclopedia Catholica, Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him, gave birth to Jesus at the age of 12 and at the same age married Saint Joseph, the carpenter, who was 95 years old. An age difference of 83 years. Yet Muslims never resort to such infantile behavior as insulting Christianity for this because we know that we cannot judge people who lived many centuries ago for violating the norms and laws of contemporary society. This brings me to the matter of age of consent. Until the beginning of the 20th century, the age of marriage in Western countries such as Canada and France was 11 years old. Even until this day, in New Orleans, a girl can marry with the consent of her parents at the age of 13. In Islam, the consent of the guardian as well as the consent of the bride is a requirement. The fact is that he was a prophet and an exceptionally handsome, generous, and kind man. Any woman would have been happy to marry him and he could have married any woman of his choice. So if he was inclined towards young girls, then why wasn't it his practice to marry such girls? 